Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, returned from a day or so off, my co-host, my partner in crime. You know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, it was kind of interesting, dude, today, Pro Football Focus. Let's just start with this really quick. And By the way, I hope you're doing well uh, and enjoyed your day off. Yeah, it was nice, but, you know, always ready to talk more Broncos football. I actually miss you, Chad. On that Tuesday going into Wednesday, you know, I'm sure it's it's mutual as well, but I'm, I'm always happy to be back on here talking with Broncos fans and, and diving into it. Absolutely, dude. We get the itch. You know, we right. got we to gotta, we gotta get the access. Um, but today it was interesting. Pro Football Focus released a rankings, a quarterback rankings, and it was based on this particular ranking of an advanced metric that is centered around deep ball passing, right? And they went through and based on deep ball accuracy, deep ball efficiency. And of course they categorize a deep ball as anything that's 20 yards, 20 plus yards down the field that counts as a deep ball. Well, I clicked on the link and I followed it. I read it all the way down. I'm not seeing Drew Locke. I'm not seeing Drew Locke. Finally, the last entry ranked 33rd is Drew Locke. And Zach, I want to read this to you. Here's what PFF said. First of all, He completed 27.3% of those passes. He averaged 8.7 yards per attempt with a quarterback passer rating of 55.9. And then here's their little analysis clip. Quote, Drew Locke took just 11 deep shots over the season. So this number comes with a significant sample size caveat, but it felt more worthwhile than analyzing Joe Flacco's struggles. Locke completed only three of those 11 pass attempts for 96 yards and a touchdown, but he also had one picked off. Obviously, he would need to improve from here if he is to succeed in Denver, close quote. So, Zach, we've talked a lot about not getting too caught up over the small sample size thing in terms of, you know, the 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 trope that it's almost like you can't take anything Drew Locke did uh, and analyze it because it was such a small sample size. As if we learned absolutely nothing about Drew Locke over that five weeks. With that being said, though, how much – what should fans read into this particular statistical distinction? I mean, you can you can break it down from the literal sense. You can go back and look at his throws down the field. You can pick apart his throws from the small sample size of five games that we saw last year. But when you really get deeper into that, it, it's mental masturbation, Chad. I hate to be so blunt about it, but you're really being nitpicky over a rookie quarterback who is raw. He doesn't have the same offensive system. He doesn't have the same supporting cast. It's upgraded now. I wouldn't read a lot into what outlets, especially PFF, it's subjective. They're not the end-all, be-all. I wouldn't read too much into what they're saying. All we can do is extrapolate what he did last year and project it to this season. But all these estimations and predictions go out the window as soon as they hit the field in September. It becomes a whole different ballgame. So we can look at it from a numbers perspective or a stats perspective, but forming a narrative around that or an opinion is inconsequential, ultimately. I tend to agree with you. But I will say this, even though it was only 11 attempts of 20 yards or more, in a Pat Shermer offense that does prioritize a more vertical passing attack, you know, a little bit more aggressive in that sense. It's something that I I regret big time that the, that the Broncos are unable to really practice and get reps in. I'm hoping that he, he Drew Lock gets together with his receivers now while if now that he's back in Denver, try and get everybody together until at some point, hopefully in June, they can get the band back together, coaches and players at the facility. But I'm worried, Zach, that this time off could affect his opportunity to significantly improve that that chemistry to allow you to connect on some of those deep throws. But it's not really something you got to worry about at this point, fans. You you look at the 33rd ranking and it's notable and you're like, man, it kind of kind of smacks you in the face. But as Zach said, it's just not enough there. 11 balls. He threw 11 passes, 20 yards or more. And so at this stage, it's kind of a. Uh, not so much a nothing to see here, but just don't read too in, too far into it. He'll have 11 deep pass attempts within the first, might be even the first week against the Titans, Chad. I mean, he's going to blow past that number right away, especially with Pat Shermer being a quarterback whisperer, having a upgraded supporting cast. I'm not too worried about the time off or the lack of chemistry being built. I really count on Drew Locke's intangibles coming through at this time, Chad. Being a leader, being the alpha – Picking Peyton Manning's brain and learning what it takes to succeed in the NFL. It's not just completing passes. It's what you do to put yourself in a position when the decks are stacked against you. And who better than Peyton Manning to do that in Denver? So Amen. 
I really have faith in Locke that he can emerge from this and not have a, a hitch in his development as a first-year starter. Speaking of Peyton Manning, I hope you guys have enjoyed Peyton Manning week so far at Sports Illustrated. We at, um, at Mile High Huddle, we've been retweeting all the content. They're pulling out cool podcasts from the vault, Peter King interviews from when Peyton Manning was recruited to Denver in that entire period of time. So I hope you're enjoying that. I wrote a column yesterday kind of detailing the – the impetus, the pivotal turning point in the Manning era, the week six Monday night football comeback in 2012 when he brought the Broncos back from a 24-0 halftime deficit in San Diego, and that changed everything. They went on from there to win uh, – well, it ended up being 11 consecutive games, but 10 more games after that in a row, and uh, basically birthed what was an unprecedented four-year period for the Denver Broncos. Go check out that column when you get a chance. And enjoy Peyton Manning week right now at Sports Illustrated. Gang, we got a couple more topics we want to get to. Of course, we want to find out what's on your mind. We'll get to the chat stream here in just a second. I want to give a quick shout out here to Johnny Baby, who uh, popped in with a very generous super chat and then you, bounced John. out. You know, we love you, John. You'll be listening to this after the fact. We really appreciate you. He says, can't stay due to work, but we'll watch later. Hope my MHH fam have a great night. And don't forget to smash that like button. Hashtag state of being. Hashtag. Denver Broncos for life. We really appreciate you, John. And Zach, it just, I mean, he he's not even in the live stream right now. He's jumping in, showing support, and he's going to circle back and listen. It just blows our mind. It does. And not only donating, but encouraging others to smash the like button. There's no incentive for him. He's not being prompted. There's no nothing in it for our listeners, Chad, and, and the support and dedication we get. Thank you again, guys. It's, it's truly humbling. On a quick note, <clears throat> with regard to Super Chat, as you guys know, we like to – Shout out our superstars after each podcast on Twitter, tagging people. I'm always telling everybody to reach out to me so I know what your Twitter handle is, all that stuff. That is going to continue. However, for some weird reason, the place within YouTube analytics where we can gather all that information and copy paste it, all that stuff. It's also where you see me go during a podcast where if the chat stream jumps and we can't scroll back up and grab it, it's that place in YouTube I can pull it. For some reason, it's not updating. Normally, it updates in real time. And so have a little patience. If you're not getting shouted out on Twitter immediately after the show, just know that we're waiting for that to self-correct. It must be some kind of a glitch. It's been going on since the Building the Broncos podcast last night. We were unable to do what we like to do. But anyway, we'll uh, see what's on the Supers' mind here in just a second. First, guys, just a couple of quick matters of business. You want to make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. And if you are following the podcast on Twitter, you will know that we have another swag giveaway going right now if you go to apple podcast to the huddle up pod li uh, listing leave a creative review you can win a football priest hat you can win also a actually what it was it's a football priest t-shirt and uh mask. mhh face mask so go if you haven't at this point left a creative review go do that great way to support the show and uh, following on twitter is how you can be apprised of those things and also you want to follow at mile high huddle if you're in a position, check out the merch store. You can get a hat like this. You can get a T-shirt. You can get a mug. You can get the face mask. little something for everybody. Hoodies. I know we're going into summer here, so Here's no one's mug. really worried about hoodies. Exactly. Uh, but if you're in a position, check that out. Get your swag on at huddleuppod.com. And if you're not in a position, it's all good. The simplest, easiest thing you can do is you're here with us now. And while you're here, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure that you like this video. And if you really love what we're doing here, share it out there. Share it out to your friends and family and followers on social media and help the show continue to grow at an exponential pace. We appreciate you. All right, Zach, before we grab real quick, just a welcome in to, to those who've been hanging out in the stream. Robert, Darvel, Juan is in the stream doing his thing. What's up, guys? Um, Justin, Toy Mafia, Stoney, Brian, good to see all of you guys. How's everyone's Wednesday doing? Yeah, I hope you're having a great Wednesday, everybody. And this is really weird because, because I can't access that information, it feels like I'm kind of flying blind here. So I want to try and be as on top of the chat stream tonight as we possibly can for that purpose, Zach. So I want to get to just one other quick storyline, and then we'll just go straight to the stream and see what everyone's thinking about. And that is Ryan Clady kind of weighing in on the Garrett Bowl situation. Now, those of, most of you know well who – Ryan Clady is, but some of you might not. He was the Denver Broncos 2008 first round pick out of Boise State. He was basically on pace, Zach, for a Hall of Fame caliber career 
until the injury bug really started taking him down. I want to say 2013 through 2015, he just couldn't stay on the field. And uh, eventually the Broncos traded him to the New York Jets where he finished, uh, played one year, could only appear in like half the games. And then he said, all right, I'm going to retire. But he still managed as a Bronco to go to four Pro Bowls, three All-Pro nods. You know, he played in a lot of playoff games, started almost 100 regular season games for the Broncos at left tackle. He's still the only left tackle, Zach, in NFL history to start all 16 games as a rookie and not relinquish one sack. That's Ryan Clady. So he knows a little something about the position, and he joined earlier this week uh, Nick Ferguson and Cecil Lammy on their show, 104.3 The Fan, Nick's, uh, Nick and Cecil. And he was asked by Cecil Lammy what he's seen from the beleaguered Garrett Bowles throughout this three-year career with the Broncos. And I just want to read this quote to you. He said, this is Clady speaking to, on uh, Bowles, quote, I think he's definitely had a well-documented slow start to his career. I've seen a lot of improvement. I've seen him definitely put some work in. Later on uh, in this past season, too, he was playing at a much higher level. I think one of the main things is hands with him. He's got some pretty good feet. It's what you need for a left tackle. But I think his hands and just kind of awareness, too. A lot of these holding calls can somewhat be avoided with just learning the game more and just having awareness of positions you're in and whatnot. I think those are a couple things he definitely has improved on. And then the last thing Clady said here is, quote, hopefully he can have a good year this year and obviously get a good contract as well, close quote. So kind of also touching on or intimating the fact that he didn't get that fifth year extension for, or you know option from the Broncos. But Ryan Clady, you know, he's, he's telling it like it is. Hands and awareness, Zach, and he's, he sounds relatively optimistic that Bulls might be able to get those things down. We'll see. It's all still what ifs. It's all still possibilities. It's also a, a person's opinion. It's all fluff and conjecture. And maybe it's my Bulls bias showing right now. But I, it, it's oh, drop my keyboard. It's worthy. Uh, you know, Clayton's opinion holds weight for sure. He knows what he's talking about. If anyone's in it to the uh, opine on Garrett Bulls, we have to listen to Ryan Clady. But he's not playing the position for Garrett Bowles. Clayton's not on the field. It's Bowles. It's 72. He has to be the one to prove he can handle the job. He can be the long-term guy. He can get that contract extension from the Broncos. They're giving him an open competition. They yanked his fifth-year option. I mean, the deck is really stacked against him. Some people think he can succeed. Others, like Mark Schlereth, think he's not worth a squirt of urine. Right. So it's really subjective as to what you what side of the camp you fall on with Garrett Bowles. Obviously, Clayton knows what he's talking about, but it's still up to 72 to go out there on Sundays and prove he can be that guy. Indeed. You know, when when uh, when Clayton talks, especially as it re- relates to the left tackle position, we're all going to perk our ears up and pay close attention. But that's definitely something that Bowles has struggled with. I mean, just really quickly, speaking to the hands issue, he it did get better down the stretch, but that's been one of his problems is his punch, landing his punch on time and doing it with power and precision. And when he doesn't, when that's been off, it kind of tends to put him behind in the rep a little bit. Guys are able to use leverage and keep him off of their chest plate. And then when he gets behind in the rep, so to speak, he panics. And then what happens? He holds him, he tackles him to the ground. So hands are really important, especially from a pass protection perspective and awareness, as we all know, Zach, you, you hinted at it. I mean, it's, it's down in distance. It's a clutch situation in the game. It's just always having your wits about you and your poise and being smart enough as a student of the game too, to know what you can get away with and what you can't. And I think that's something that, that he was hinting at there, Clady, in terms of studying the game. But it's like you're talking about the two biggest qualities for an offensive tackle, especially a left tackle, a blindside protector to have. It's like saying a quarterback going into his fourth year chat is can't hit a barn or he doesn't have he can't throw past 30 yards. This comment right here, we'll get to Michaela in a second. This comment right here by Ben Lee, he's going to his fourth year in the league. Why are we still talking about him needing to learn the game? Why are we making excuses? Ben, I made this exact point uh, last on last week's pod. He's in his late 20s, He's a former first-round pick. He has the best OL coach in the business. The excuses are over for the guy. It's over. I, I mean, he's really creeping up against bust territory, and he's saving himself from either that or Paxton Lynch territory. I, I just – I can't make excuses for him. I mean, it's it's all what-ifs now. We, it's He's a former first-round pick. Enough is enough. 
enough is enough. And hopefully the signs he showed down the stretch, you know, that's what the, the I wouldn't say the Broncos are banking on because they're going to make him sing for his supper this summer and compete for that left tackle position. By the way, Elijah Wilkinson, we touched on this a couple of days ago, but just had surgery on his foot. So it'll be really interesting to see what they do there, Zach. That should alter, I would think, the urgency question on whether or not they look a little bit harder at bringing in a, another left tackle option, even as a depth guy, while you've got Garrett Bowles still not quite proven himself through his learning curve quite yet. Michaela, we really appreciate you jumping in. Thank you, Fifteen dollars super. So uh, supportive and so consistent. We really appreciate you, my friend. She says, silly thought, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to put a lady smart brain into Bull's body? <laughs> LOL. So close to the 7K. Heck yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. We need like the, you know, the Frankenstein, young Frankenstein. Remember that movie? We need that guy to slap a smart lady brain into in between <laughs> Bull's ears. How about just a normal functioning human brain or a normal brain in general, Chad? I mean... <laughs> This is another comment here by Bobby. I mean, he has a learning disability. He was raw when we drafted him. Excuse, excuse. When it clicks, he will be just fine. He's in his late 20s. He was a former first-round pick. He's in his fourth year. I mean, are we going to keep saying this year six, year seven? How much more excuses do we have to make for the guy? He doesn't have it no matter who hypes him up. I mean, he has to prove himself, Chad, on a snap-by-snap basis. And that's part of the problem is – the Broncos don't have forever. Garrett Bowles doesn't have forever to, as you say, when it clicks, it clicks. And that typically is what happens with every NFL career trajectory is there's a learning curve and then all of a sudden it clicks and you can see it in their play. It happens at different points for different players. But for Garrett Bowles, he's entering his fourth year. He's running out of time for it to click. So we'll see how it shakes out. We want to uh, say thank you to Stu jumping in, showing some love on Super. From uh, MHH Mount Rushmore, hope everything's going good for you, my friend. Thank you, As Steve. always, it's great having you in the stream. And I echo Buona Beast here for Steven. Hope yeah. you're back to normal with the uh, wisdom teeth thing, dude. That's no fun. Hope everything's going okay there. He's saying here, playing some Madden right now, and the Broncos offense is really fun. So it can't be too bad. If he's still able to rock Madden, he must be doing all right. Good Those to see you, Steve. Going. Mike Evans jumping in, showing some love on Super. Really appreciate you. Thank you, Mike. Love this show. Will our special teams become a threat in 2020? I guess it would depend on how you define threat because there are multiple aspects to special teams and, and their impact on a game. But do you see this team having a bona fide threat as a returner? Do you think yeah. the punter is going to be able to flip field position, be a weapon? McManus, what are you thinking about the third phase? I think McManus will be consistent, but he's not going to be the McMoney guy that we came to know in years past. I think that in terms of kickers, if they have upside or ceiling, I think McManus reached his. But he will be consistent. He's still what the Broncos need. He can kick an altitude. Sam Martin will be an upgrade on Colby Wadman, but Chad, you and I would have been upgrade on Colby Wadman. It's not saying much. <laughs> He'll be average. He'll be whatever, mediocre. Um, the return teams, Hamler, that will be an upgrade. Though I think uh, Deontay Spencer was fine in that role last year, but Hamler, it's part of the reason why they drafted him. I think the coverage units should be good. I think it should be solid tackling, but it's still Tom McMahon. That's the question mark to me. That's the black sheep of the special teams unit, Tom McMahon. As long as he's calling the shots, I can't say with certainty they're going to be difference makers on specials. With him as the coordinator, we have to hope they can be consistent and average or above average. I agree. I agree. And Nad Ludlow showing a little love on Super. Really appreciate Thank it, my you, friend. Good to see you as well. All right, let's see what else is on everybody's mind here. I don't know, Jody, about Patrick Mahomes being uh, overrated. I think that's a little bit overrated <laughs> of an overrated comment. <laughs> I hate saying it, but we all know it's true. Drew jumping in with an extremely, wow, extremely uh, generous Super Chat, Drew. An OG rocking the wow. football priest. Hat in his YouTube profile pic. You know, we we appreciate you and we Thank love you, Drew. Means amazing. the world to us. He says, uh, no one should take pro football focus as gospel. They're good with stats, but projections are never a perfect science and everybody sleeps on us. That's a fair point in both counts in terms of, you know, PFF as content creators. PFF has some really interesting advanced analytics that we can utilize to build stories and, and accentuate our articles and our videos and our podcasts. But they also, when it comes to the grades, you've heard Zach and I talk a lot about this. Sometimes it, it can be 
it can come off as extremely arbitrary the way they grade players. Yeah. So the grades so much, I don't get caught up in some of the more advanced analytics. It's not involving opinion what whatsoever. It's not a grade. It's not, it's actual metrics. Now this particular stat of, you know, completing efficiency on passes 20 yards or more down the field. The biggest issue here is simply that, you know, he, he attempted whatever it was. Um, I want to say it was well, over 150 attempts in those five starts, something approaching that only 11 of them were 20 yards or more. So that's why you can't really get out over your skis on this one, Zach. Yeah, I agree. And um, I- I'm actually perfectly with you on that, Chad. I, ac- I echo what you said hundred percent. Troy rank. Great dude. Saying that lock. Let me check this out. I, want, I last time I got on Twitter while we were podcasting, it got me in a little bit of hot water because I can't even remember what it was now off the top of my head, but I'm just checking Troy's uh, stream real quick here. I think he said he was going to throw. He was going to get a throwing session together. I'd be surprised if it's happening right now, Chad. Yeah, it should be happening soon. I know yeah. that the NCAA is allowing uh, college players and athletes to return to facilities in June. Uh, I think June 1st, if I'm not mistaken. So things are opening up there. The NFL is going to follow suit and it's, you know, Drew just needs to get those reps in though, as soon as possible. He doesn't have to wait for the green light from the NFL to come back to facilities. Uh, Fronty PRO wants to know, what do you think about D Ware's comments saying that uh, he will be a force to be reckoned with? Are you speak? uh, What did he say? He was talking about Chubb, right? When you say he Fronty, are you talking about Chubb? Because I, I saw him, I saw that, uh, quote today that he said, uh, I think it was something to the effect, Zach, that Vaughn and Chubb is a more potent pass rushing duo than Vaughn and Ware because Chubb, you know, was stronger. I can't remember exactly the quote, but you expect a guy like Demarcus Ware to say something like that because he's a class act. It's not necessarily something I read too much into. Plus, he literally coached the Broncos linebackers in yeah. recent memory. So he's he's a big Broncos supporter, but he's a Von Miller type where he's going to talk up the Broncos players, um, even to a point, to a bias point. So, you know, I, I think Chubb is going to come back and be that 2018 Chubb that we saw. And I think he has more to his repertoire than d did, especially late in his career. But it's still Demarcus Walker talking up a former, you know, uh, pupil. Yes, and Jerry, uh, appreciate that on the Peyton Manning call. Put some time into that sucker. You guys can tell that's almost 2,000 words when you read it, but it's it'll be worth your time, I promise you. Check it out, milehighhuddle.com. Speaking of Super Chat superstars, David jumping in. Appreciate you, my uh, friend. Thank, thank Very you, generous dude. super. He says, hey, guys, do you think that Brandon McManus is safe or are we looking at any kickers? You guys are awesome. Hashtag five-star show. Appreciate thank you, David. You. And if you have left a review on Apple Podcasts, five-star, baby, you know uh, we really appreciate that. I have not heard one thing this year that would point to the Broncos being interested in another kicker besides Brandon McManus, even trying to stoke competition. Um, It wasn't too long ago. I think it was last summer, wasn't it, Zach, that they brought in that former AAF kicker, very short term. Yeah. Second spell, I think it was even with the team and uh, whatever they were hoping to see from that in terms of maybe a more motivated Brandon McManus. Maybe they're trying to rein him in behind closed doors. I don't know exactly what the purpose behind that was, but the Broncos appear to be completely committed to Brandon McManus for 2020. Yeah, you know, they made other moves. They wanted to replace their long snapper. They replaced Casey Carter. They wanted to replace uh, Wadman. They replaced Wadman. They didn't replace Tom McMahon. They're happy with him as coordinator, and I believe they're happy with McManus as the kicker. If they wanted to replace the guy, they would have signed a kicker by now or drafted a kicker. I think McManus is definitely safe for this season. Lee Royce, good to see you as well, my friend. Thanks for joining us on Facebook. Darian jumps in, $2 super. Really Thank appreciate you, you. Can we get an MHH combine? Hashtag state of being. <laughs> hashtag like button. Hit that like button, people. That would be uh, yeah, so dope. I think this was a topic that was broached on the BTB pod last night. An MHH combine. I don't know that I would win any of those. Uh, I probably come. It would probably come down to Zach and uh, – Pro- the most physically fit, probably Zach and Nick, I would guess. You guys would have to duke it out for all the athletic, <laughs> you know, distinguished. He, he's he's got me in the 40. I'll take the bench press. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what are you benching right now, dude? Don't don't lie. Tell the truth. I haven't been in the gym in like two months, so I'm probably, <laughs> it's probably down to like 200. But it, it might, you know, about 350 consistently before that. 
He's a gym rat, guys. He's dying not being able to go to the gym. Yep. Uh, Bronco Batman jumping in with a $2 super. Thank you, Thank my you. friend. Saying hi from good old Arkansas. Love the show, guys. Appreciate that, my friend. And uh, James is going to do one of these jumps, so let me grab this. James jumping in and brings up the, the exact same point. Very ap appropriate. PFF isn't the be-all, end-all for sure, but they yep. do have a point. Main thing, holding Drew back is experience. Too small a sample size. A lack of deep throw uh, completions. Also, scheme chemistry are factors in that. And I would agree, agree 100%, which is why he really does, you know, need more time on task throwing with not just Sutton, but Fant and his new receivers this year and just build on what they established last year. You know, I want to tack on to your previous point about pro football focus. Now that we have that question, I, I will say it's a tool, but it's not the tool. And a lot of writers and media type and blue check marks, they use PFF as the narrative setter. And it's really not that. And a few years ago, I was guilty of doing that. I would look for the numbers. I would base my, not my opinion, but a lot of my research on what pro football focus has to say. There are ordinary people like you and I. They have brains and they have opinions like you and I. It's not the end all be all, but that's what happens when you follow that group think chat. The blue check marks, the national media types, they all rally around whatever's fad right now. And a, mm -hmm. for a while in the, in the NFL sphere, especially on Twitter, Pro football focus is the end-all, be-all, and it's definitely not that. So you have to take into consideration what they say, but don't base your opinion 100% around that. And just don't believe everything you read. I'm I'm right. the type of person that is skeptical of everything I read. Yes. And, and here. Conventional wisdom, you know, I'm a trust but verify guy. It doesn't yeah. mean I completely disbelieve you out of the gates, but I'm going to verify, yes. you know, especially if it strikes me, if it's something that, you know, jumps out to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to verify what I see. So – you let your eyes do a lot of the talking when you see some of these more advanced metrics, when you see rankings out there, power rankings. If it passes your eye test, roll with that because that's going to be the, the more true evaluation more often than not, even if you're not a football expert per se. And Duke jumping in, $20 super. Really appreciate you, Duke. Flexing like a boss there in his profile pic. He says, God bless Netflix and Hulu. Why? They're airing The Patriot. And in the words of Mel Gibson, <laughs> I urge my brothers at MHH to stay the course. Thank you, Chad and Zach. Stay the course. Duke, that's, right. that's cool, man. That's one of, uh, Great one of my, movie favorite, too. My, yeah. my favorite movies when I'm in kind of a, you know, history mood or, you know, patriotism mood, obviously. And, and <laughs> Mel Gibson basically recapitulating the brave heart into right. Amer the American Revolution. Before he went a little. He Ooh. did. He did indeed, and uh, that's a topic for another time. <laughs> Bobby jumping in, showing a very generous wow. super chat. You Thank don't have you. to do that, Bobby. We really appreciate you, my friend. She's got her uh, mug on the way, mm -hmm. her T-shirt still uh, getting made, and hopefully I'll have some news for you on that topic, Bobby, here very, very soon. So we appreciate your patience on that. She says, thank you for all you do, guys. Can't imagine how much time you put in to entertain and to give up-to-date information on our Broncos country. Thank you guys. You guys are great. Love Broncos country. That's, That's really awesome, sweet. Bobby. Thank you. Bobby, appreciate you, my friend. That is very meaningful. Best and uh, we do put in a lot of time, but guys, it all is worth it for us because, I mean, again, this is a podcast. There was a tweet. I can't remember who it was that tweeted right not long before we went live tonight. I quote tweeted one of Huddle Up's um, you know, promotions for tonight's podcast that had the YouTube link saying something to the effect of looking forward to talking uh, with you tonight, right? Very just uh, just something I would say. And this quote tweet, Mile High Something, anyway, said something to the effect of, that's what I love about MHH podcasts is that they talk with us, not at us. And I thought, to me, that was actually a very meaningful uh, response on yeah. social media, and we just appreciate that level of sentiment. Speaking of social media, we can't, Ignore our awesome Facebook audience. Clay here says, people say that the Broncos fixed the interior O-line to help Drew, but do you possibly think it was to help Philip Lindsay have actual holes to run through and by helping the run game, thus helping Drew Locke? So you're, you know, you're killing a couple of birds with yeah. one. Spinner. 
Yeah, but Lindsey wins along the edge, along the perimeter. He doesn't win up the middle, and that's my biggest criticism of Rich Scangarello last year, Chad, was running uh, Lindsey inside and Freeman outside. It made no sense to me. Melvin Gordon should benefit from having an improved O-line. The entire Broncos offense will benefit from that, but I don't think they did that with Lindsey in mind. I don't think they did anything this offseason with Philip Lindsay in mind. Literally nothing. It wasn't a Philip Lindsay centric offseason. It was a Drew Locke centric offseason. Terry Randall jumping in up in Canada, proving, as always, that Broncos country is not a geographic location. It is a state of being. And his message is stay awesome, you guys. Broncos country is the best. Hashtag state of being. Hashtag Broncos world. True that. No lies detected. Jason, that's one of my favorite sayings, dude. If uh, And there's a lot of different variations of the ifs and buts cliche. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we all would eat our fill. I think that was the original. And then other people, I've heard people say, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we all would have a Merry Christmas. And like you say here, but uh, he says, uh, if ifs and buts, we all would have a Merry Christmas. The man is a pro talking about bowls and needs to figure it out. Come on, man. Echoing Zach <laughs> <laughs> Glenn here. Get your mind out of the gutter, Glenn. <laughs> I mean, both appropriate right. references, though. I will say that. Yeah. In the, Family in friendly. The, both of them said in a clinical sense, okay? Get get, get your mind out of the gutter. Uh, BNS jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. And also, I know you're one of the great listeners. I don't know. It's approaching 300 of you or so who have left creative reviews on Apple Podcasts. And BNS, I know you're one of them. Appreciate you out there. He says, Aloha from Maui, gents. Bottom line, with the three guys lining up next to him this year, you will see what an animal Bowles really is. He did finish last year in the top two left tackles in the league. You know, I think, BNS, I share some of your uh, hope in terms of Bowles put, bowl putting it all together. But really, it was just that final stretch. It was week nine through the end. And as we all know, it wasn't perfect, but week nine on – Something about that, maybe it had a little something to do with the buy that came. What was it, week 10, I, I want to say, was the buy? Something about fixing something. I don't know. But he need, he just needs to carry that momentum, Zach. If, we're, if, if we speak about it on an optimistic level, he just needs to try and parlay that momentum into 2020 because this is the put-up-or-shut-up time for him. It, it is, and it's encouraging. I mean, we've been we've been talking about this before. Yeah, it's encouraging. He showed a consistent above average stretch last season, but does that little brief stretch overshadow three years of incompetence? For me, it doesn't. If he was a, a fourth round, fifth round pick, I'd be fine with it. But he was a number twenty overall draft pick. That's a high first round pick. He's a blind side protector for your franchise quarterback. He has to prove it more so this season. Despite what he did last year, despite having Mike Munchak kind of help him along that process, he's still very, 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 very much unproven, and he has no benefit of the doubt, no matter what he says or what he does, until proven otherwise. Ryan, longtime listener of the show, says, Hey, Chad and Zach, can you tell me without going out on a limb if the team or anybody on the team ever gave any opinion on how they feel about bowls? I don't think anyone's ever spoken uh, spoken negatively on it from I'm trying to think back Rolodex in my brain here of storylines. I don't think anyone's really ever said anything that could be perceived as negative publicly. Elway. But but Elway, you know, front office, absolutely. Fangio has said some things that could be construed that way. His teammates, though, you don't think that absolutely frustrates them, if not <laughs> more than the coaches in the front office. So yes, it's been just as frustrating for his teammates, but they also recognize that, you know, he goes to battle and he's, he's got everybody's back and the whole nine yards, but they're pros. They're, they're thinking the same things we are in terms of, come on, dude. I mean, if in the middle of his third year on a public radio station in Denver, the GM is actually querying Zach, does he even know what holding is? <laughs> that's an answer in and of itself. And he also said, Elway said, everyone is frustrated with Garrett Bowles. Everyone. It's not just the coaches, not just the front office. That means the players, too. It's a very prideful locker room. And can you imagine Joe Flacco, who literally admitted he doesn't want to be a mentor for Drew Locke? If he got sacked by Bowles last year, can you wonder what he's thinking? And, and that's the one thing I'll agree with Joe Flacco on. It's unacceptable. It's ridiculous. You can't have that incompetency at left tackle. He's not the only person. I'm sure there's plenty on that team, Chad, like you just alluded to who are very, very frustrated. George, one of our superstars and MHH Mount Rushmore members, jumping in with a very generous Thank super. You, Appreciate you, Gio. 
Man. says, hey, guys, just checking in on the best podcast on the planet. Appreciate you, my friend. George, have you left a review on Apple Podcasts? If you haven't, take care of that. But I think you have. Kyle, also showing some love. Really appreciate the super, Thank my you, friend. Kyle. Just got out of Air Force BMT. What is BMT? I, I'm not sure I what that know. means, but we appreciate you. This is a podcast very friendly to our armed services yes. and veterans. We appreciate you, Kyle. Thank you for your service, for sure. As far as the D-line goes, do you see Jarrell Casey playing any nose tackle? And who is replacing Will Parks in sub packages? So a double pronger there, Zach. You, uh, I, I think you're going to see Casey play some, some nose, some zero tech, yeah. some one shade on like passing downs, different, you know, NASCAR packages, if you will, yeah. get different guys on the field from a base perspective. I don't see that happening right now. My money on that, that sub package role for the Will Parks replacing that. I'm probably going to put my money on. Whew, I boy. think it comes, it's Trey Marshall. It's a saying Bassey and it's, and it's uh, Douglas Coleman. I mean, the obvious one there is Trey Marshall because he did play well down the stretch uh, when Kareem Jackson was suspended. But something's telling me one of those two undrafted rookies is going to have something to say about it. I, I don't know. It's too early for me to say for sure, though. Could be Isaac Yadam as well at safety. That's, that's a possibility as well. Um, yep. I, do, I do think Trey Marshall is the favorite right now. It's his job to lose. But Douglas Coleman will make a lot of noise this summer. Uh, in terms of Jarrell Casey, like Chad said, he said it perfectly. On sub packages, passing downs, he'll be playing the nose. You have Shelby Harris alongside of a defensive end, Vaughn and Shubb along the outside. It's going to be fun to watch this defense. But in base packages, he'll be playing three and five technique positions. Indeed, guys. Thanks for uh, liking this video. We really appreciate you. Go on a beast there with a shout out. Glenn, jumping back in. Appreciate you, you as Glenn. well. Glenn, you were super chat superstar. You've been a big supporter of MHH on the YouTube channel. So thank you, my friend. Looking forward to the MHH Combine. Thanks for a great show. Sorry, Chad, but drumming won't be part of the <laughs> Come on, dude. There are drummers that do take the football field, right? But maybe only in college with the marching band. Um, Christopher on YouTube wants to know, hey, guys, love the pod. Appreciate you. What do you think about a four-wide set with Hamler and Judy in the slots? Sutton and Fant or Alberto on the outside. I feel like that could be deadly. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And I think you're going to see Pat Shermer and Drew Locke. There are a couple of kids in a candy store with the, yeah. all the different ways they're going to be able to attack. It's just going to come down to Locke being that competent, you know, distributor of the ball. He's He's got to be that point guard that is on point. You know, I wasn't the biggest fan of the KJ Hamler pick when it was made. I wasn't crazy about the Broncos doubling up in rounds one and two. But then I thought to myself, the collection of talent they have for Drew Locke, all the different matchups and, and ways they can exploit the opponents, it's going to be fun to watch. And I've been saying, win or lose, the Broncos offense will finally be fun and exciting and enticing. And it's something we haven't seen since Peyton Manning. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All the different things that Sherman can do. JL Avenger, greetings, guys. Good to see you again. What can... Uh, what can be about the left tackle through what can be done about the left tackle through free agency with Beecham or Peters mile high salute from paradise in Costa Rica. And by the way, JL Avenger, I have not replied to your email yet. I did see it. I have read it. I do have some questions uh, that I wasn't clear on what, what you were asking about. So I'll be replying to you here soon, but uh, what can be done? I mean, the Broncos can go out and sign one of those guys where they're still available. And I think with Elijah Wilkinson being in a walking boot and a scooter right now, I know that there's no football to be played tomorrow necessarily, Zach, but man, that's a harbinger I don't like. Get some, get another live body in there, even if you got to pay a bit of a premium. Even if Wilkinson was healthy, you're still one snap away from him starting, and that's a dangerous, scary proposition. He's an awful tackle. He's an okay guard. He's a good swing guy. I don't want him starting. I don't want him protecting Drew Locke's back. Regardless, I don't care if it's at this point Peters, Beecham, Glenn, trade for someone. They just need to have someone behind Bowles and James. Sorry about that if I distracted you. I'm trying to pull up. So when the stream gets shared, <clears throat> excuse me, in the MHH super fan group on Facebook, it just shows up as Facebook user. It doesn't show the name. So I pulled it up to see who actually is asking this question. And it, I didn't have my phone muted. Let me see who asked this question because I hate just – 
Mark Cortez. All right, Mark. Hey, guys, love your show. My question is, will Drew Locke win the MVP <laughs> this year? Um, <laughs> Broncos MVP, team MVP, maybe. but League NFL MVP, MVP, man. Hey, we've been optimistic in, in trying to tell you that uh, wouldn't surprise us if he's that next second-year quarterback that kind of comes out of nowhere to take the league by storm. I still feel really high on that as a possibility, but it's too soon for me to say, yes, he's going to be the MVP next, this year. I, I will say, don't expect it, but it's definitely possible that it can happen. He has all the talent. He has the supporting cast. He has hopefully better coaching. If you can put that all together and the stars align, it could be the year of Drew. Uh, Kevin, jumping in, $10 super, one of our superstars. Appreciate Thank you, you Kevin. He says, you guys should get a tailgate tent so the MHH fam can all pregame before the home games. Definitely something that we have talked about doing. You know, we've kind of been – um, what's a good way to put it? We've been more of like a site journalism covering the the team, and it's really been this last year where it's taken on more of a community identity as Mile High Huddle. So it's definitely something, Kevin, that we are taking under consideration, and uh, we will holler at you when we put some ideas together. Um, Brian here wants to know, I thought to ask you, Beast, if you would please help my question and move up to Chad, please. Brian, if you repeat your question, I'll, we'll get to your question, my friend. I didn't see one, and it might be because the stream jumped you, so bear with us there. Uh, Clay on Facebook, I heard from ESPN the way Elway knew to draft KJ Hamler, even though he didn't run the 40, was they took the 100-yard kick return and timed him from the 30 to the opposing 30, and he ran it in 3.3 uh, 93 seconds, and that's when he got – uh, not going, not counting the two or three yard acceleration. Yes, that's an, not even an apocryphal story anymore. That was told by Matt Russell, the director of player personnel. That was Vic Fangio, and it was Vic Fangio that timed him. You got to, as, as as you mentioned there, when a guy already gets ahead of steam and then you start timing him from the 30, it's not the same as measuring a 40-yard dash because 40-yard dash is also not just taking into consideration Zach long speed, right, and how fast you are but your explosion to get up to top speed, how quickly you get to that point. So still, it was enough for the Broncos to say, yeah, let's pull the trigger. Fangio turned out to be the guy pounding the table for Hamler in the second round. I, I liken this to when a player runs a pro day at their own track or their own stadium. They always are very complimentary with the time that comes out from that 40 yard at, at their home field. I have no doubt that Cage ha Hamler is super fast, but that, that 393 time, whatever it was, Chad, might be a little exaggerated, but regardless – Speed demon, exactly what Drew Locke needs. I think he's a four two, high four twos, low four threes guy when it Which comes is out. Fast as in the wash. Very yeah. fast. Andy, happy birthday to Rick Upchurch. Amen. And me. Oh, cool. Happy birthday, right, Andy. Happy birthday, Andy. Ha ha. Thanks, Chad and Zach. Love what you're doing for all the Broncos fans. Hashtag we believe. Hashtag winning seasons to come. Love the optimism and happy birthday, dude. You uh I would sing it to you right now, but that song is actually copyrighted. And wouldn't you know it, we'd probably get a claim on YouTube oh, yeah. and Facebook. Uh, Jerry, yes, Mahomes is uh, hes not overrated. He's the real deal. Uh, Dennis jumping in, superstar. Thank appreciate you, you, my friend. He says, saw a video on the remaining free agents. It said DBs should uh, or Denver Broncos should go after Clay Matthews and the Jets going after Peters. Huh? Well, I would. I wonder where you saw that. I know it wasn't from MHH. We have made a video or two about remaining free agents. I'm 100% sure Clay Matthews was not mentioned on either one of those because edge is not something the Broncos need right now. Peters was mentioned as a possibility, but he – I don't know, Zach. He's, the, the longer this goes without Peters getting signed, the more I'm inclined to believe he might end up being there till training camp. Yeah, it seems like he wants either starter's money or a starter's job, and right now there's just not either of them on the open market for him. Uh, the Jets are linked to everyone, though. I mean, literally every free agent they sniff around, so I wouldn't look at that as a barometer. Jason Peters, he's putting out videos right now. He's putting out statements through his agent. I mean, he's trying to maintain leverage and try to get a contract. But again, if it's Jason Peters, Cordy Glenn, Kelvin Beecham, I do not care at this point. I just want a capable insurance policy behind two of the most unstable tackles in the business. Ron Dub jumping in, one of our super chat superstars. <clears throat> always look forward to Ron's questions and yeah. comments. He always makes us think. This is spot on, too. We need to stop making excuses for a fourth-year left tackle. I'm honestly tired of talking about bowls. 
We just need to cut our losses and sign someone. Which current lineman would you trust to help lock the most? Spot. Absolutely Jason Peters, period. Yeah. Put a bow on. I mean, he's probably going to be in the Hall of Fame. And, yeah, he's long in the tooth. He's 38 years old. But Andrew Whitworth in L.A. has proven that the left tackle position, you know, might have a little bit longer shelf life in the NFL nowadays, Zach, with sports medicine being what it is, um, than some of the interior positions that are, you know, a lot more collisions and whatnot. So I think that it just com would come down to how you structure the contract, what kind of money a guy like Jason Peters is asking for. Yeah. But if you're looking for a set and forget option at left tackle, Jason Peters is your guy. You can squeeze two years out of him, and by that point, you're just looking to put a Band-Aid at the spot until you can draft or acquire your long-term left tackle. He's not going to be a guy for 10 years, five years, but two years, absolutely. Still play at a very, very high, if not Pro Bowl level. There is no downside to signing him. The Broncos have the money, the need. Uh, he would come in and play for a contender. I feel like I, I would make it happen, but at this point, they just need anyone behind Bowles and James. This is true. This is true. Charlie wants to know, does somebody sanitize the balls after every throw? Probably talking about what's going to happen. Um, well, here's here's this ties in also to Bobby, I think, on Facebook. Did you hear the NFL is experimenting with PPE masks on helmets? Yeah, I did hear that. WTF indeed. Um, there's just – look, I don't want to derail the pod with topic <laughs> that shall go unnamed, but – for the players themselves, I mean, all you got to worry about is if someone catches it, they just can't play for two weeks, and that's a major bummer because they have to go into the into the keyword right for two weeks if they catch it. But the statistics say that if you're not 80 years old, you're you're probably going to be okay. Now, look I, again, I'm not trying to say anything. People are taking now extremely partisan and political stances on something that should have nothing to do with those those topics. Yeah. So. I don't, I don't want to go any further than that, but the idea of sanitizing the, the balls, the idea of wearing a face, a, a mask inside your mask, <laughs> you're going to tackle a dude. You're going to get sweat on. You're going to get excreted upon. Sorry to be gross. It's football. <laughs> it's physical. It's, it's collisions. It's violence. It's the whole nine yards. And the same goes for basketball. Contact sports are contact sports. You cannot PPE your way out of right. exposure to each other. Let me just put it that way. I saw something on Twitter where it was a mask that has a slit so you can eat while you're wearing the mask. It's like, what is the world coming to? What are we really doing right now? If you told me in January, February, this is what we'd be exploring right now, the questions we'd be getting, Chad, I would have not believed you. I thought you were crazy. It would help the players. It, it's for safety, yeah, but the, the players and the teams and the GMs and the league has to know if they go through with this in September, if they have the season, there's a good chance someone's going to catch – the issue. It, it, it's inevitable. So they have to just uh, come to terms with that being an inevitability and not just a possibility. Gary Palmer jumping in with the $5 super. Thank you, Gary. Says, sorry, I didn't catch you live yesterday, but all love, love the passion. Rick, LOL. By the way, Gary, Zach and I were off yesterday, but as you know, you got one podcast for every day in the week at Mile High Huddle and it was building the Broncos. So, uh, we, we're just glad you're with us here tonight, my friend. Uh, James jumping in to say, the 2017 draft still gives me heebie-jeebies. Amen, dude. I wanted a draft class of Kamara, Alvin Kamara round one, Deion Dawkins round two, Chris Godwin, George Kittle round three, oh. Anthony Walker Jr. round five. Still oh, upset. Yeah. In hindsight, yeah. That's what's so frustrating about that 17 class is not just that the guys busted, but the guys the Broncos could have drafted instead. I mean, even Jake Butt, who – really through no fault of his own has been a bust for this team. You, the player that they left on the board, I mean, oh, you could have got George Kittle, but now you've got Noah Fant. So, you know, you live to fight another day, but you're always going to wonder. And James, it really is a, it's a horror show, man. That 2017 class, Bowles, Walker, Blaine, but Henderson, two Hendersons, right? Carlos Henderson and D'Angelo Henderson. Or was, yeah, D'Angelo was 2017. Jake Butt. Jake Butt. David, oh, that was 2018. I always get that confused. Chad Kelly, seventh Chad round. Kelly. But, yeah, what a what a you-know-what show. All right, guys, what, how are we sitting? We're at 49 minutes, so let me make sure we're not missing anybody in the Supers here. 
you know, there's a really good chance by next offseason, the entire 2017 draft class could be eradicated from the roster. Bowles, Walker, and Butt. There's a good chance none of them return in 2021. It's just crazy how bad that was of a job by John Elway. Crazy to think, dude. It really is. Ryan, uh, do, he says, do you guys think Pat Shermer is about to break out a new offensive philosophy with multiple tight ends and multiple backs? Catch the NFL off guard with an unknown quarterback? Uh, not necessarily, but here's what I will say. You know, part of a, the job of a good coordinator, whether offense or defense, is to take their core philosophy, their scheme, and fit the players into it, yeah. right? Or, or other way around, excuse me, fit the scheme to the players, right? And so that's why it's kind of hard to know exactly what to expect is we can go back and watch film of Shermer's offense that was being basically ran by Mike Shula in the last two years in New York. You can go back to the Minnesota offense, but each one is unique because it's based and centered around the personnel. The Broncos have some really unique personnel, very formidable tools here for Shermer to work with, and he's going to have a lot of creative options. But that's the one thing I'll say, Zach, is he's going to have to be creative. And with a guy that's, that kind of springs off the Andy Reid coaching tree, I don't think we're going to have to worry too much about lack of inspiration. Yeah, I, I don't see him changing his stripes overnight or in terms of one season with the Broncos, but I do think he'll adapt to what the NFL calls for nowadays, and that's a two running back system or at least deploying some sort of a committee approach with Philip Lindsay and Melvin Gordon. I understand Gordon's going to be the quote unquote workhorse for Shermer, but they cannot ignore Philip Lindsay's skill set, what he brings to the table, the traits that he brings that Melvin Gordon doesn't have. So I don't think he's going to make a two running back system his staple, like you said, Chad, but he's going to incorporate elements like you, like Andy Reid's a perfect uh, example. I mean, he rotates running backs, four or five different running backs. And I think Pat Shermer, depending on the opponent, the down, the distance, the situation, he will conform to those kind of strictures. Christy jumping in with a very, wow. very, very generous. That's amazing. Super the chat, queen. showing some love and support. The queen of MHH herself in the house. And uh, it just – Blows awesome. us away. We we thank you so much, Christy. And we're going to be having Christy on the podcast here very, very soon as we inch closer to our 7K mark. We'll talk a little bit more here in the near future about what that podcast is going to look like. But uh, we've already touched base with Christy. She's down to join us for a little segment. So stay tuned for that, you guys. She says, if Garrett Bowles took responsibility for his shortcomings, he might take the initiative to get better. He could surprise us all. You never know. I'm not holding my breath, though. Thanks, guys. Stay amazing. That's been the other thing that's so frustrating about Bowles is he has developed a reputation within the club of having a sense of entitlement. I've told you the apocryphal stories that I've been told about him literally turning away from coaches who are trying to coach him if he messed up on something and the coach gets on him to say, hey, man, here's what you should have. You should have zigged instead of Zach just turning around, walking away. So that sense of entitlement – compounded with the fact that he does have a real learning disability compounded with his relative lack of football experience, Zach at left tackle. It's just been a, a non-productive concoction or equation yeah. that relates to playing the position. And that's one of the reasons why he struggled to find consistency. Yeah, you know, he hasn't been able to put the entire meal together, but he's seen different courses. He's had different appetizers. We want the entree, though. We want the dessert. We want the fruits of his labor to come out and be a full, consistent 16-game performer. I don't – it's a non-zero chance. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm saying there's no way in hell he's going to be a consistent left tackle. He has the upside to grow into that, at least be stable. I don't think to be a long-term franchise guy, that's out the window. But to be stable, average, consistent, you can get by, passable, whatever word you want to use, I think that's within the realm of Garrett Bowles' ability. Amen. He had – one of the reasons the Broncos fell in love with him, the bully mentality – and then also his athletic testing at the combine. I wouldn't quite say he blew up the combine, but he had a very impressive showing athletically. Uh, so the raw talent is there. It's just taken way too long to shape that raw talent into a polished gem. Clay, uh, letting us know, BMT stands uh, for basic military oh, okay. training. Very cool. Chad, my mom's boyfriend is a master sergeant, so I know this stuff. Very cool, Clay. Appreciate you filling us in on that, Duke, to uh, jump in and say, anyone else here absolutely love this pod? I mean, during these trials and tribulations, <laughs> we are a family on this pod. They are the football priests, and I'm honored <laughs> to be part of the fam. It is a family, dude, and that's one of the things that uh, 
you know, you hear the word addictive and you think negatively, you think like it's, you know, possessing somebody in addition. But that's one of the things that is, I, I mean it in a positive sense here, yeah. that this podcast has become for, for Zach and I, it's, it's addictive because we get to interact with you guys in real time. We had fun getting together a few times a week and having a few, you know, topics we want to get to and just talking about them amongst each other and recording it. Boom, got a podcast. But this is a next level thing for us in terms of enjoyment, being able to talk with you guys and engage with you in real time. Because we had mailbags in the past, Zach. We, yeah. we would take questions and the whole nine yards. But this is just a different animal. It feels archaic now compared to mm -hmm. what we're doing with Super Chat and interacting. I, I will say it's so great to me that even the comments that we get, even um, – the questions we get, the super chats we get, our listeners and our our viewers are so careful not to mention the word. They will say trials and tribulations. They will say, you know, the W. They will say the C word. They will go out of their way because they know that we're avoiding that as well. So everything you guys do, we notice it. We appreciate it. You guys are truly, truly the best uh, audience in the entire world. And Chris, it's good to have you on the live pod, man. Welcome in. Um, and that's another thing is, you know, when you're doing something – positive when you're doing something productive and you're making a difference you're always going to have haters you're going to attract attention when you become the king of the hill there's going to be a lot of uh people that are going to be gunning for you right and such is the case i don't know i guess we'll call them haters uh for huddle up for example just the last i don't know three four days we've had a rash of one star reviews on apple podcasts now zach and i if someone comes to us on apple Podcasts and tells us we think your podcast sucks or here's what you should do. It's a one star rating. Here's what I think you should do. We can live with someone saying they don't like the podcast. That's not yeah. a problem. But what we're seeing and how people kind of betray their intentions is people outright lying on these Apple podcast reviews. And what these people don't realize, Zach, is that we can actually have those removed. So <laughs> people think, oh, if it's Apple podcast, the publisher has can have absolutely no impact on them. We can. We can talk to Apple. And if it's, you know, certain strictures, I'm not going to say what they are, we can have it removed, which is why we're kind of putting out a call to action because what they're trying to do is on Apple Podcasts, how how high your rating is, it's a five-star system, how high your rating is plays a role in how much Apple will show your podcast to people who search for certain keywords, right? So if you have very few ratings or a low rating, when someone types in Broncos or Denver Broncos or Drew Lock Podcast or anything like that, right? The keywords they're not going to show your podcast. They're going to show the guy who has, or the podcast that has hundreds and hundreds of, of reviews and the whole nine yards. So what these people are trying to do is torpedo our rating and thus try and hurt the podcast because they're hating on it. So that's why we need you guys. It's a real call to action. And also we're, we're giving a little something, something at, in terms of the drawing and the giveaway to get on Apple podcasts, leave a creative review. If you like what we're doing here, leave us a five-star rating and help to kind of offset what those haters are doing. And Brian, he says, on this podcast, so much awesomeness, most amazing pod, Chad and Zach, 10-star MHH, most favorite. Brian, really appreciate it. And I'm reading that because I know you had a question, and I thought that was the question, but thanks, my friend. Uh, Damien, jumping wow. in. Very, Damien, thank you. Very generous super, one of our superstars on Super Chat, saying, keeping that football addiction alive. There it is, see? can be a good thing, that addiction word. Hey, watched a couple podcasts, and I'm in the minority, I hope, that the new linebacker, can cover talking about Justin Sternad because we have not fixed that issue and it's been a thorn in the other place. It really has. And I think once he kind of shakes off the rookie jitters and gets through that learning curve, I think Sternad has a legit shot, Zach, at being that that answer. I think it's inevitable that he takes over Todd Davis's starting spot as long as he can adapt to the NFL and transition and develop, which is no easy task for sure, especially when he, someone like his injury history, if he can overcome those two impediments he will start by midseason next to A.J. Johnson, forming a long-term pair that will be exciting and dynamic. Brett, the uh, Brett-tastic one on Twitter, jumping in with the $20 Thank super. You, Brett. Appreciate you, Brett. He says, hello, gentlemen. Great show as always. Make sure to smash the like button. We love it, dude. Taking ownership, chipping in. Appreciate that, Brett. Ben, jumping in as well. $5 super. Appreciate you, Thank my you, friend. Maybe a bold take, but I think the Broncos will hit on five of their 2020 draft picks. Very interesting. That would be a pretty uh, close to the mean. I think it's in the 50 percentile, somewhere in the fifties of, you know, depending on how you quantify success or how exactly. you quantify hits, yeah. but nevertheless, 
Broncos made 10 selections this year. Zach, what do you think about the idea of five of them being hits? Well, I think uh, obviously, you know, Jerry Judy will be a hit. I think Cushenberry will be a hit. I think um, Albert O will be. It, it, like you said, though, Chad, how do you define hit? It's subjective. Does it mean he's going to go on to have 10 year careers or going to go on to have a thousand yard season for a pass catcher? I, I think a good majority of the draft class will contribute now and into the future. And that's really all you want for your draft class, for your rookies. Immediate contributions and also long term sustainability. The Broncos have both. It's the highest upside draft class the last three years. You know, rookies, you can never say for sure exactly how it's going to shake out till you see him on the field. But still, I think Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. All right. I think Ojemudia. I think Cushenberry. Those are four that I feel really confident are going to be hits. Good chance McTelvin Ajim is also a hit. The more I studied that dude. Sternad. That, Sternad as well. So it could be one of those classes. Albert O. It could be one of those classes. Um, Oscar jumping in to on super chat to ask what positions should be looked at next off season. Tackle, tackle, tackle. tackle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good question. And Oscar, thank you for the super, yeah. my friend. It really is like, even if Garrett Bowles steadies his play this year, Juwan James, we'll see if he can stay healthy and on the field after this season, the Broncos have some freedom to get out from under that contract. If he doesn't, so offensive tackle, I think Zach is probably going to, as you say, be at the top of that list. And, you know, we could break it down more in depth, probably corner, probably more linebacker. Kicker. We'll see how it shakes out. But offensive tackle would have to be the priority. Yeah, kicker as well with McManus. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know. I mean, they're pretty well stacked along their along their team, Chad. I was going to say uh, secondary, but definitely the offensive tackle is priority number one, regardless of what Garrett Bowles does this season. Christy? We echo that. Welcome to all the newcomers. And the, the show, especially on YouTube and Apple, is just growing by leaps and bounds. And to all our new listeners and live viewers, we really, really appreciate you. And we're glad you're here with us. All right, let's see what else we got. We're at, we've crossed the one hour mark. So uh, let me see here. Where is. Hmm. Sorry guys, bear with me. I don't norm I don't have the normal tools that are at my disposal because of this glitch that's going on on uh, the back end of YouTube. So bear with me one second. We'll grab BNS here with Joe Rogan. Leave appreciate the five dollar super, my friend. Thank you. Um, with Joe Rogan leaving YouTube, my priests should be moving up the mountain. Keep up the great work, guys, and watch Oku o Oku Webunam. Oku Webunam. That's how it is. He's going to be a beast. I hope so. And Zach, I don't, and again, thank you, BNS. Did you see that news, by the way, that Joe Rogan is taking his Spotify. podcast exclusively away from uh, YouTube and taking it to Spotify? Yeah. My question is, you say exclusive, but what does that really mean? Because an RSS feed, when you create a podcast, you, you can't always dictate what platforms are going to host that RSS feed. Does that mean he's going to stop uploading to his eight point something million followers on YouTube? That wouldn't make financial sense. That wouldn't make any sense. So I'm really curious in real, in the, in the practical application of what this means, but I love it because I think it, it says something in terms of resisting some of the censorship that's taken place increasingly yes. on, on social media and YouTube is a social media channel. Yeah, you know, he owns the intellectual property to the Joe Rogan show, and he's well off. He, he's not scraping by. I'm sure Spotify gave him some sort of guarantee or advance of, to host his podcast on their platform, but it's smart. You know, YouTube takes a cut, and YouTube is uh, censorious, to use your word, Chad. There's a lot of different political leanings on these social media platforms. I think it's smart by Joe Rogan. He knows he has an organic, natural, huge, massive following who will listen to him regardless if he's just uh, talking through cans attached to str strings. They will listen regardless. It's, he knows his fan base and his demographic. Guys, if we end up missing a super chat tonight, just know that we will make it up to you. I don't, I'm hoping we won't, and I'm hoping that we haven't. But if we do, just forgive us. Our, we'll, we'll find a way to make it up to you. Um, just keep that in mind. Dennis jumping back in. He was, he appreciate the super. Thanks, he says yes. that video was from TPS, uh, Jason Biondo, Biondo hashtag state of being from Michigan, baby. That's cool. TPS. What is TPS? 
Is that uh, one of the ES, like ESPN first total hit? total pro sports? I don't know. Total pro sports. I'm just sports? I'm literally just guessing. Might be wrong. Uh, Miller seven oh seven. Good question here. Appreciate. It. He says, "What's up, Chad and Zach? If Lindsey or Gordon get injured, knock on wood, and Freeman comes in and balls out and impresses everyone, what do you think Denver would do? Who would be the odd man out? I really don't think they're either one are going to get injured. But if it were to happen that way, the, either way, Gordon's going to see the field eventually because the Broncos owe him $13.5 million guaranteed. So he's the guy that is has a pretty bulletproof situation right now. He's on the two-year deal too, so odds are he's going to be around next season as well. And unless he just is, is so bad this year, that would force the Broncos' hand. And Philip Lindsay would be a restricted free agent. So among the three, I think Gordon, you know, it depends on how you feel about it. He has the best job security. I think Freeman has the worst job security. James Richard jumping in with a $5 super. Thank you, James. Appreciate you. I don't care. And by the way, I'd be curious to know, maybe you're not a fan of the Predator movies. Maybe there's a reason, though, that you have that as your profile pick. I'd be curious what you think is the best Predator movie, not counting the first one with Arnold. I don't care what you call it. It will always be known as Mile High Huddle. Subscribe, like, share, hit the bell, share Broncos back to back. However, he's correcting himself. What he meant to say was Mile High Stadium. But you two probably liked it. Um, yes, we did. Thank you, my friend. Uh, yeah, I mean... Even it doesn't matter who the sponsor is. I mean, it does matter, but it's Mile High Stadium, right? At the end of the day, it's Mile High Stadium. It can be Invesco Field at Mile High. It can be Sports Authority Field. It can be uh, what's the what's the new one? I Empower Field, right? But really, it is Mile High. Always, no matter what they put on the on the sign, no matter what they call it, it'll always be Mile High Stadium. Poppy jumping in again. You don't have to do that. Thank, thank you, Bobby. We really appreciate your super. Awesome. She says, thank you, Oscar and KR, my first whole number super chat. I don't know. What does that mean, whole number? I don't know what that I means, but know. thank you, Bobby. Really appreciate you. It all chips in and helps out tremendously. And here's Gio. You guys are like family now. After the Broncos game, I won't be able to get in here and talk about the game and, and plays that impacted the game. Why, why wouldn't you be able to, bro? What are you talking about? Gut reactions are the best pods. After every Broncos game, I won't be able to get in here. Well, maybe you got a, a new job or something. Let us know. Yeah, let us know, my friend. Um, appreciate you, George, but it is like a family, and you're part of it. James, again, as of this Super Chat, you, you guys James. have 80 likes and only one dislike. Don't be discouraged. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, buddy. We're, listen, the haters, guys, if you're going to be in this business, mm. and I don't want to necessarily call ourselves public figures, but if you're going to be in the media business on any level, you do have to have a thick skin, as Zach said. Barry. And so, trust me, we're not losing any sleep over it. It does um, suck that it requires our attention when someone tries to torpedo us on uh, Apple Podcasts. We have to take time to try and correct that, and that's what we hate the most. You know, I learned something a long time ago, Chad, you know, throughout my 20s. And it's a lesson that can serve anyone well and personal, professional. People don't hate losers. And that's really what it comes down to. If, if you're having haters, it means you're doing something right. I'm not patting myself on the back and Chad's not patting himself on the back. We're not, you know, glorifying our own show here. But we, at least I do, I embrace the haters. I have never shied away from the criticism or the clapbacks or anything like that. I just feel like if we have those detractors, Chad, it means we are definitely doing something right in this business. Exactly. Sebastian, good to see you. What's going on? I know your birthday's coming up, so happy birthday to you, my friend. Damien, again, jumping in on Super. Appreciate you. you DC Dub, what is the best direction to go uh, in regarding free agent wise, in your opinions, is it safe to say that Bowles is on the bubble and would you'd like to have Peters? James is the truth when healthy. Talking about Juwan James. Um, really, the only thing that's really nagging at me right now is the left tackle in terms of just being exposed and vulnerable. You just don't know what's going to happen with Bowles, James being an injury concern constantly. And now Elijah Wilkinson coming off a of foot surgery very recently that he's still in a boot and he's still in a uh, with a scooter so left tackle i would love in a perfect world to have one more veteran corner but if bryce callahan bounces back that's not as big of an issue to me and michael ojamudia i'm really high on him so for me it really does that come down to free agent how about or uh, left tackle how about you 
the, the Broncos, to their credit, did a really, really solid job filling out the roster this offseason. They nailed pretty much every need, every every luxury they added to, you know, players like Jarrell Casey. But left tackle and right tackle, the tackle position is still the bugaboo for Denver. Again, they are one snap away from now having Jake Rogers or Calvin Anderson be a starting tackle. Haven't they learned by now through all the years that Donald Stevenson's, Menelik Watson, Jared, Jared Valdez, you have to have a better contingency plan in place than a sub a sub average starter. By the way, I'm hearing here that the the uh, Joe Rogan deal with Spotify is something to the effect of 100 million for his podcast library, wow. which is insane. <laughs> um one day anyway, chat. <laughs> yeah, someday. James Campbell jumping in from across the pond, big time member of the community and uh one of these days here soon James, you and I need to have another discussion. He says Oscar, it's very early days. Generally Use free agency to fill needs and approach the draft without major holes. Draft for talent over a three-year period, which is true. That's a good point. And I think the Broncos, you know, they did a pretty good job of filling the most immediate holes, but they didn't do anything. Well, I shouldn't say anything because at corner they did grab A.J. Bouye, but but nevertheless, again, it's left tackle that's jumping out to me, Zach. It's it's that's the only major glaring roster hole. If they just land a Peters or Beecham or, or Glenn, it would have an A plus 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 offseason, Chen. Uh Buff Fanatics, this is the way of the future. <clears throat> Talking about podcasts, like you see all these new premium movie TV channels popping up indeed. And uh we'll see how that shakes out. Hope everything's going okay. Buff Fanatics is a Buffalo Bills website, and uh they do a great work doing a good job. So appreciate you being in the stream. Uh, why is it the one hour mark always the mark to finish? If we're asking question, why does the show have to finish? Only because um, there's only so much time that we have without taking away from some of the other things we're required to do uh, with milehighhuddle.com. And Zach also does stuff with heavy. So it's just the, the allotted time that we have, because when I get off of this podcast, I'm spending a whole other hour nearly, not quite, but sometimes depending on if there's any glitches or problems, editing the podcast, uploading it to uh, Apple so that it's at Apple, it's at Stitcher, it's at iHeart, it's at CastBox. It's a, so for, look at it like this. For every hour that we spend on the pod, it requires another additional hour to also upload it as a podcast after the live stream. So it's just the way it shakes out. But we do have to hurry here. Huges, huge, huges, $10 super. Thank you, my friend. And I don't recognize you, so welcome in. Glad to have you in here. Never get to catch this live, but love the content. Keep it up. Super excited that my – ooh, his, his oh, face mask shipped today. Nice. Rad, Lucky. dude. Make sure you hit us up with a uh, with a selfie when you get that, dude, so we can shout you out on our social media. James again jumping in. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. He says, so far – so this far out, everything is on the board, even the quarterback until Locke shows he is the guy. So talking about the draft next year. Uh, we all think he will be, though. The boundary corner, offensive tackle, swing tackle, safety, ILB, and a sixth DB. I don't disagree with any of that, Zach. I don't either. That's that's pretty spot on. I think that's the direction the Broncos are going to go if they're being honest with themselves. All right, guys. I think there's – we just want to make sure we haven't missed anybody. And if we did miss anybody tonight, I will hopefully be able to recognize that with the back-end analytics, and we will make it up to you tomorrow. I promise you that. Up oh, two more, two more, and then we got to go. Um, from Dar the Dog again showing up. Good to see oh, you, Dar. Appreciate, appreciate that, you. super. I'm in a bad mood, but this podcast always cheers me up. Hey, that's good to hear, man. We are a family, and we got each other's backs. This is true. I love Broncos country. Do you see similarities between this offense in 2013? Hmm. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> similar in that you're going to see a lot of shotgun. You're going to see a lot of spread. Peyton Manning was the king of the spread, king of the shotgun. In that sense, from a production standpoint, don't get too far out over your skis. I was getting really excited yesterday writing that Peyton Manning column, just reliving that 2013 season and 2012 and and even 2014. But let them, let them at least start scratching the surface before we start getting too far out there about <laughs> – you know, they're going to score 607 points this year <laughs> and beat the Broncos 2013 record. And I don't mean that as disrespect, Dar. I do think this is going to be a really good offense this year, but don't crown them quite yet. 
I think it's going to be the best we've seen since 2013, but maybe not on 2013's level. And that my first part of that comment is relative to what we've seen the last three or four years. They're going to be explosive. They're going to be fun, vertical, aggressive. But the one glaring comparison you have to make between 2013 and 2020 is quarterback. Drew Locke, as much as we love the guy, huge, huge fans of him, he is nowhere near Peyton Manning. Unless he's standing side by side next to him, he's nowhere near. Then he's near. Exactly. But until then, he has to prove himself. James jumping in again. Thank you, my friend. He says, Drew Locke, 3,500 yards. Judy opening up Sutton, who collects 1,200 and 9 to 11 touchdowns. Other scenario, Sutton double teamed. Jerry getting the bulk possible rookie record year. Let's say you, um, I think Locke's going to have a little bit closer to 3,800 between yeah. 38 and 4,000 passing, right. but I think 35 is kind of the floor to be honest with you. I mean, in 12 starts last year, Daniel Jones eclipsed 3000 yards passing in 12 starts. So, and that was Daniel Jones. I know he went higher than Locke in the draft and all that stuff, but I'm telling you, he's not the same dude that drew Locke is. And Sutton, that'd be a good building on top of what he did last year, getting to 1,200 and double digits on TDs. And Judy has possible rookie records. I, I mean, if Drew Locke ends up taking that quantum leap, then yes. Right. But we just won't know until we see it in action, Zach. If it's going to be the year of Drew Locke, then yeah, Jerry Judy can win Oroy. But I'm with Chad. I think he's going to be around 38, 3,900 because you figure 35 is a little over 200 yards a game for 16 games. It's not a lot for someone like Drew Locke, especially in this offense, throwing a ton down the field. <laughs> regardless, they're going to put up the stats, light up the scoreboard, and again, it will be fun to watch, regardless of how the stat column breaks down. John Mortensen jumping in as well with a generous super on the way out. Appreciate that, John. Thank you, John. He says, hey, guys, driving through Kansas City, Missouri right now. Can't wait to see how these new drafted players turn out. You guys are doing a great job. Keep it going. Appreciate that, John, and uh, really do appreciate that. Drive (laughs) fast. Get out of there. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder, Christy. Zach's column, it's a mailbag, but it's not always going to be a mailbag. Yeah. Kelberman's Corner with a K. So check it out. His uh, his latest published today, go to milehighhuddle.com and check that out. And as always, if you want him to address something directly, tweet him, email him, DM him, whatever, and he can address it in an actual article for you. But guys, that's got to do it for today's episode of the Huddle Up podcast. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us here live. And it's a mile high salute to our super chat superstars. You know, we love you and appreciate you a reminder here, gentle reminder. You got to head over to Apple podcasts and leave a creative review. Uh, You don't have to, if you would, it would be much appreciated by your football priests here because we need some help balancing the scales. And tomorrow night we're going to announce the winner of the drawing. So if you entered into that. If you entered a new um, review from yesterday, which was Tuesday through by the time we go on live tomorrow night for the mile high mailbag, you'll be entered in. We're going to do a random selection. We're going to give away two pieces of swag to that person. So take care of that guys. And you can find the link. If you're not sure how to get there, go to huddle up pod Twitter and you'll see it in the bio Apple podcast, the whole nine yards. But also uh, I guess you need to know exactly how to find the Twitter account. Most of you already know this, but at huddle up pod, that's where you find it. And uh, don't forget to subscribe 35, 40% of our listening audience on YouTube watches every single podcast, every live stream, but they're not subscribed. Take care of that. Rectify that. Make sure you subscribe before you bounce on out of here and like, and share. And Zach tomorrow is our favorite podcast of the week. So if we didn't get to your question today, we'll try and get to it tomorrow. Save it. We'll try and get to it tomorrow. Yeah, I want to segue, take James, a little late super chat there. James dropping five bucks. We appreciate you, James. He, I want to just answer this chat, then we'll get out of here. Yep, yep. I, I only say 3,500 for lock because we have to run the ball TD style, but with a random backfield. Yeah, you know, I, I can definitely see with the running game clicking consistently. If Melvin Gordon exceeds expectations, it might impact Locke's numbers. But like Chad said, 3,500, I think, is the bare minimum floor for him as a first-year starter. I don't disagree. And James, thanks for keeping the conversation going. I'm sorry we got to cut it loose here, guys, at at an hour and 20 minutes. But you know we love you. We'll be back in the saddle tomorrow night. For Zach, I'm Chad. We'll talk to you 615 Mountain, 815 Eastern tomorrow night for the Mile High Mailbag.